bless you and keep you. He's already promised to. We'll be in Hebrews 11 this morning. And this week and next week, we kind of uh, are going to walk through a couple of verses that are not, um, well, they're not fun to talk about. Because we're going to deal with death. And, uh, you know, we do everything in our power to avoid death. As a matter of fact, a man once asked his friend what the death rate was in his city. His friend replied to him quietly, one apiece. <laughs> and that's the ratio everywhere. Death occurs 100% to each person. Death isn't an accident, it's an appointment. It's not that I'm afraid to die, wrote Woody Allen. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> but he will be there. And you and I will be there when it happens to us. Nobody has yet figured out how to peek into God's appointment book and erase the date. Yet for the man and the woman of God, death is nothing to be feared. It's only a doorway into a full and complete life. Death should be something that is sh a shared moment for the godly person. It's the passing of the person into a new and full relationship with the Lord. And worship takes on a whole new level at the homegoing of the saints. Our passages this morning, starting first in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21, will take us into the quiet moments before the death of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. This man who schemed his way into blessing, schemed his way into wealth, who wrestled with God one night is now an old man about ready to die. A man once said to his pastor, Pastor, I am always cheered up when I read the life of Jacob. For if the grace of Almighty God was able to straighten up that man, there must be some hope for me. And that's the point of Hebrews chapter 11. That there is hope, biblical hope, assured hope that God will straighten us up and mold us into his will just as he did with a man named Israel. And so this picture of the sunset of Israel's life is one of extreme beauty which we would all do well to learn from and apply within our own families even today. Now we see a cycle here that really starts way back in Genesis 47. In the last part of that one chapter, we see Jacob worshiping God. And here in Hebrews, we see the wording is, look at it, by faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. He blessed, and then he bowed in worship. I want you to take note of that very, very carefully. The cycle is worship God, bless your children, worship God. Bless your children, worship God. It starts and it ends with worship. And that is how you go about finishing with godly faith. Before you can ever bless you have to worship the Blessed One. So I'm going to invite you to come with me and quietly slip into this room. Notice Israel. He's lying on his bed. His body is frail. His eyes are dim from being almost blind. And yet you can tell his mind is sharp. There's a peace about him as he lies there on that bed, almost as if he's having a quiet conversation with a dear friend that's in the room who we cannot see. And so Israel turns and he bows himself on his bed and he worships our God and our Father. As we step into this room of death this morning, 
and we watch Israel take his last breath. Father, help us pay close attention to how a godly man dies. And not only how he dies, but how he lived. Father, as we hear from you, I ask that you would point out things in our life that we need to submit and bring under your lordship. Not things that we need to correct, but things that you want to correct in us. And give us the courage to bow, repent, confess, and worship. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. My God, my strength, my Redeemer. It's in the wonderful matchless, grace-filled and mercy-giving name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. It starts with worshiping God. By faith, as he was dying, Jacob worshiped. Friend, that's the reason that we even exist, is to worship God. Plain and simple. I don't care what you do for a living, I don't care where you go to school. I don't care what kind of education you have or don't have. I don't care what your big plans are. I don't care how much money you have or what economic class you're a part of or what ethnicity you come from. Our job, our only reason for existence is worshiping God, period. Scripture is clear on that. Turn with me quickly. If you can find it, maybe the pages of your Bible are still stuck together, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. If you can't get there quickly, just listen, because I'm going to move on from here very fast. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the preacher who was writing this, says in verses 13 and 14, The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. I love the word every there, because it leaves no one out. If you think it doesn't apply to you, you're wrong. Because you're part of the every. I mean, remember that commercial? Uh, some of you are way too young to remember this, but that commercial for, for all detergent? A-L-L. -L. Yeah, I mean, you remember that one, right? And, and, and you know, we're, we're sitting there, you know, we're young, and, and they, they bring it up, and the kid starts to point his finger, and we're all like, A-L-L. -L. And everybody learned the word all from detergent. Why did they put it on there? Because it cleans all clothes. All of us are, every person is designed to worship God. And if you don't with your life, verse 14 tells you what's going to happen. For, every, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You say, well, I don't really see that um, there's worship involved in there. Well, listen, if you have children or are around children and they do what you tell them to do, when you tell them to do it, without talking back, without giving you an argument, you are blessed beyond measure. And we're all like, oh my goodness. But how many of us don't do what God tells us to do, when he tells us to do it, how he tells us to do it, gladly, without complaining, without arguing? When you obey the commandments of God, you're worshiping God. The prophet Isaiah goes even further when he writes these words in, in his book. And it's actually, he's quoting God speaking here when God says, Everyone who is called by my name. Who? Everyone. And whom I have created for my glory. I love how some people try to parse this verse and go, well, not everyone is called. <laughs> yes, read the next line. Everyone whom I have created. Because <laughs> he's created everyone. And he created why? For my glory. Whom I have formed. Even those whom I have made. See, God's like, if you don't get the first part, let me be clear. Right? Because how many of us as parents, we do that? Uh, apparently you didn't understand. Now explain to me, was it the N or the O right. you didn't get? <laughs> Let me, let me see. And God, God does that. God's like, okay, you didn't quite get the fact that I created you. How do we know that? Because we have a whole religion called 
humanism that tells yeah. us that it wasn't. Yeah. And God's like, okay, so, so you'll believe I created you. Who am I formed? Mm. Every. A-L-L. <laughs> created. The reason you exist is to worship God. You see, it's living in and by faith is the way of life for a mature follower of Jesus Christ. You know how you could tell, one of the ways you could tell someone who's not mature in their spiritual life, they don't live by faith, and they don't live in faith. They question everything that the Bible has to say. Now, understand, I'm not saying don't ask questions. I'm saying they're questioning God. If that's you, I suggest you read the last part of the book of Job. Where God stands in front of Job and says, Who are you, old man, to question me? Tell me, tell me, if you can, how the stars were put into heaven. Well, it started with the Big Bang. I agree, God spoke, bang, it was there. There's your Big Bang. Anything else? Well, let's just say you're living by faith at that point, too. You know, faith is always occupied with the Word of God. True faith is always occupied with the Word of God. And it finds in the Word of God its nourishment. It finds in the Word of God its discipline. It finds its inspiration. And it finds its power. Chris just quoted 2 Timothy that says, we, we have not been given the spirit of fear, and it goes on, but of power and love and a sound mind. You know any Christians who don't have a sound mind? Maybe they're not living in the Word. Yeah. Yeah. Happy are those whose hearts rest upon God's Word and are able to say this, I believe God because He has said it, period. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. I don't quite comprehend it. I don't see how that's going to happen, but you know what? God said it. Good enough for me. And so as we live, the reason we exist is to worship God. But then the day comes, and it is coming for you. You have an appointment with death. Scripture is clear that the days of our lives are written before we ever are born. And so is the day of our death. There are many different ways to die. Let me share with you from Scripture a few of them. Find in the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, I'm going to start reading in verse 54. Stephen, the disciple, the, the deacon, is preaching. And in verse 54 it says, Now when they, the Jews, heard this, Stephen's preaching of Jesus Christ, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But then they cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the name of the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Friends, some people die through affliction. And this is not... I know there's a period at the end of Revelation... But what's going on in the book of Acts is still going on today around the world. There are Christians and other people who are dying because of affliction. Yeah. And most of us, by the blessing of God, will never have to experience that. Mm -hmm. And I say this with all candor, and I say this with gratefulness, but that's too bad. Because it's in the persecution of the bride of Jesus Christ that she grows strong. And the Western church is weak because we have no persecution to be said of us. Through the affliction, we go strong. Let me put it a different way. Those of you who attend, and I didn't say just have membership, I said attend. 
a gym and actually work out. <laughs> Are we together? You don't get strong by looking at the equipment. Boy, that'd be nice to use. I went to the gym. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I get all these likes and stuff. I went to the gym. I walked in and said, Hiya. Using the jump rope, huh? Good for you. But that's how the faith of the Western Church looks in regard to persecution. The muscles aren't torn, they aren't rebuilt. You see, salvation, some people are saved out of a life of wretchedness, and some people are saved from a life of wretchedness. Right now, the Western Church is being saved from persecution. And I suggest it's because we can't handle it. But that's a different story. Some people die through affliction. In Acts 13, it says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. Some people die through service. If you read the life of David, he did not retire. Matter of fact, he gave the throne over to Solomon and kind of coached him for about a week or so and then died. David didn't retire. He died through service. In other words, he worked himself to death. Wasn't a workaholic, but he worked up to the day of his death. We don't have time to read Matthew chapter 26 through 28 where we see Jesus Christ on the cross totally and utterly alone and dying alone. There's a lot of people that have have, have said over the years, I don't want to die alone. Well, let me be clear. If you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you will never die alone. Amen. He died alone, so you never have to Amen. be alone. Right. But some people still die lonely. Mm -hmm. Die through affliction, through service, utterly alone. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 49. Look at Jacob. The last verse of Genesis chapter 49, verse 33. It says, when Jacob finished charging his sons, or blessing his sons, speaking to his offspring, he drew his feet into the bed, and he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So, so yes, you can, you can die through affliction, you can die through service, you can die lonely. Maybe you are blessed to die surrounded by family. But the reality is it doesn't matter, because this is what is written in the New Testament. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're still the Lord's. You see, the way to die is by worshiping God and giving all glory to God, no matter your circumstances. Some of you have been um, blessed. Have you got the key word yet today? Some of you have been blessed to be a part of a memorial service for, for, for one of the saints. And it has been phenomenal. It's filled with tears, laughing, glorious stories about a life well lived. And some of you have been part of services for those who have no hope. And it's heartbreaking. Not a lot of laughter. It's even at times grotesque. I, I officiated a funeral years ago for a man that all was said about him was he liked the golf and he played the guitar. I said, what about his family? We don't care. Because he didn't care. One of the toughest funerals I've ever that's all I was given to work with. Also one of the shortest funerals I ever preached because that's all I was given to work with. How do you want to be remembered? Is your reason for living, worshiping God? We're in the room. We're looking at a deathbed. We're seeing Israel on it. 
And soon we hear Israel coughing. It, it's, it's a death rattle that's deep in his chest. His life is almost at an end. Can you see him there? But he realizes there's, there's still more to be done. He can't quite leave yet. And looking over the end of his feet with blind eyes, he sees someone there we can't see. And he smiles. And then he shakes his head no and murmurs, please, please, not yet. There's more to be done. Smiling and nodding, he sighs and rests his head back onto the bed. And he falls into a restless sleep. And this is where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 48, verse 1. Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. When it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel collected his strength and sat up in the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a company of peoples, and will give this land over to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. Now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. But your offspring that you have born after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the names of their brothers and their inheritance. Now as for me, when I came from Haddon, Rachel died to my sorrow. In the land of Canaan, on a journey, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Here Jacob, we see in verse 5, formally adopts both Ephraim and Manasseh as his sons, elevating them to a position equal with his other sons. Now, by doing this, he ensures that Joseph line will receive the rights of the firstborn, which means a double portion. This is why when you go through the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament, you don't see a tribe of Joseph. You see the tribe of Ephraim, and the tribe of Manasseh. The tribe of Joseph is not listed in the children of Israel. However, Joseph wasn't really the oldest out of the 12 boys. Reuben was. Reuben, the firstborn of the son of Leah, forfeited the rights of the blessings and the rights, first rights of the firstborn, because of his fornication with Bilhah, Rachel, servant, and Jacob's first concubine. You think you've got trouble in your family. <laughs> And so the birthright that was rightfully Reuben's by this awful act passed to the four firstborn of Jacob's first love, Rachel. And Rachel's firstborn was a son named Joseph. And so this is what's happening. He's making sure that no one can stop him. So he adopts as his own sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Saying, well, that's just... Or was the paperwork? Well, when you have the prime minister of Egypt standing in your room, you really don't need paperwork. Can you imagine what Joseph might have thought in that moment? Okay. You don't see him argue. You don't see him push back. You see him submit to his father. Let's continue. Verse 8. When Israel saw Joseph's son, he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. So he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were so dim from age that he could not see. So Joseph brought them close, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face, and behold, God has let me see your children as well. Then Joseph took them from his knees. And bowed with his face to the ground. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right, and brought them close to him. Jacob asks Joseph, Who are these? Now, don't get the idea here that Jacob has no idea who these boys are. 
And there's some figurative language here that, that, that we just have to understand is, is written in a very poetic form. Because Ephraim and Manasseh would be about around the age of 20 at this time. So when it says they were taken from his knees, it means they were standing probably next to Joseph while Joseph sat. And, and, and Jacob's not saying, I've never seen them before. I mean, he's been in, he's been in Egypt for 17 years at this point. And there's, 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 no, there's no way that you could consciously think that after um, having that long away from his father, that he wouldn't have visited him at some point in 17 years. But what's happening here is Jacob's blind. And so he sees blurry figures. And so he's trying to clarify before he gives a blessing. Who are they? Because who could have come? Well, Jacob, somebody from Jacob's servants may have come in to, to escort Joseph in and been in there. And they might have been. This is the prime minister of Egypt. It's likely that he had a whole entourage. I mean, have you ever seen a politician go anywhere without people? I mean, the, the black camel showed up. They opened up the second hump. They all walked out. <laughs> And here's, here's, you know, the trumpets are blowing, everything's going in, and, 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 and Joseph probably had, you know, a few people carrying some, some curved knives with him. And they were there. Security guards. So, so it could have been these guys. Who knows? Jacob don't want to give the blessing to the wrong person. And so he says, who's with you? Very wise on his part. He says, these are my sons. Now, how many of you have come home from college or in your 20s come home, maybe been at Christmas or Easter and maybe a family reunion, if your family still does those, and you're about 20, and there's that one grandparent that's just so happy to see you, and they grab you, and they hug you, they start kissing you, and you're like, okay, yeah. but enough of this. <laughs> and how many of you are brave enough to admit it? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But they're in a different culture. Very physical, comforting, loving culture. And, 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 and Jacob brings them. I love how I love how this is this is this is this is pointed out. Joseph, and you have to get you know a vivid imagination here. Joseph starts pushing them towards his dad because maybe they're like, oh, he's like. Now there's a reason for it. He wanted he wanted Manasseh to be blessed first because he was the oldest. But look look what happens. Verse 14. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands. Although Manasseh was the firstborn, he blessed Joseph and said, The God whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and may my name live on in them. And the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. You know what's awesome about this blessing? Jacob has finally, finally realized that all blessings come from God. He's not blessing out of his own wealth. He's not blessing out of his own name. He's not blessing out of his own issues. He's blessing from God. Verse 17. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he grasped his father's hands to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused. I love this. I love this. you got an old man about ready to die, and his young son can't move his hand. <laughs> Take note, young people. <laughs> no matter how old you get, Usually the old bull wins the young fight. <laughs> I, lo I, lo I love this. God reverses the order of human wisdom here again by raising the younger to preeminence over the older. You know, this has tended to be a pattern that God has chosen with the patriarchs. 
And you could go all the way back to, to, to Cain and Abel. But just, just look at it from, from the line of Abraham. Isaac over Ishmael. Jacob over Esau. Just earlier, Joseph over Reuben. You would think Joseph would catch something here. But he's like, no! And now Ephraim over Manasseh. And, and, and Joseph gets upset about it. Oh, not only Joseph. Joseph gets upset. How quickly a solemn and holy occasion can turn sour as our attitudes are altered when we don't get things our way. Joseph is angry. But this isn't about Joseph. Who's it about? It's about Jesus. That's who it's about. Look at how Jacob both rebukes his son and placates him all in one line. He says, look, verse 19, I know, my son, I know. He, Manasseh, also will become a people, and he will also be great. However, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. I love it. He placates him, he rebukes him, and then he keeps on going. All right, dealt with you. Now I'm dealing, by the way, I just adopted them as my son. You have no right anymore. picture here is when we give something over to God and give it with an open hand, we lose all rights. You don't get to tell God, this is what I'm going to do. When you get saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you lay down your life for Him, it's no longer your life. Amen. Yeah, we act like it is. My life, my rights, my needs, my wants, my checkbook. And I think Jesus sometimes says, I know. I know. But that's not how it's going to be. Are you miserable? Maybe you're trying to do things your way. After the division of the kingdom in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the tribe of Ephraim, as predicted here in verse 19, did become the dominant tribe in the northern kingdom, Israel. To the point that in the prophets, the name Ephraim was equated with Israel. If you go through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and you see the word Ephraim, it means the tribes of Israel, of the northern kingdom. That's how prominent Ephraim becomes. Imagine a blessing that's so far in the future that you can't see it, but you know something's going to happen because you have finally learned to listen to the Spirit of God and be directed by Him. Look at verse 21. See, so skip verse 20, Pastor. I know, I know. <laughs> verse 21. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die. Anybody ever have a parent tell them that and then like live like 17 more years? <laughs> <laughs> Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I give you one portion more than your brothers which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. This is awesome. I found this this week. I'm going to share it with you. I'm not telling you the passage. I'm going to read it to you, then I'll tell you, because I want you to listen to it and not turn there. When talking about the Messianic kingdom, when Jesus Christ rules and he's here for a thousand years, this is what's said about the boundaries of the land. Thus says the Lord God, this shall be the boundary by which you shall divide the land for an inheritance among the twelve tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. That's found in Ezekiel chapter 47. Verse 13, then it goes on in verse 14. You shall divide it for an inheritance, each one equally with the other. For I swore to give it to your forefathers, and this land will be given to you as an inheritance. They're going to get the land because it's theirs. But Joseph will get two portions because it was prophesied and blessed in Genesis 48. And it will come true sometime in the future. So look back at verse 20. Jacob blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And so he put Ephraim before Manasseh. This blessing is still used today. 
Church, we have lost in Western culture how to bless our children. And so I want to spend the last remaining part of our time together walking through the idea of blessing. First and foremost, what is it? Well, it's when you pray right before a meal and ask God to bless the food. No. No. Blessing defined is the act of declaring or giving and hoping for God's favor and goodness upon someone. All blessings rest in and proceed from God. Every single one. Humanity is, is nothing more than mere instruments and receivers of blessing. When expressed by men, a blessing was a wish or a prayer for a blessing that's to come in the future. Now, now it's not, I wish I could get this for Christmas. It's, it's not a blessing. Okay? And blessing your child with a gift at Christmas is not the blessing that's talked about. Nor is it when you remind them, if you remember that thing that got you at Christmas, that's not blessing them either. Especially if it's somebody older. Remember that candle I bought you five years ago? Grammy. Never lit it. I'm not getting you another one to eat. That's not a blessing. But sometimes when a blessing was given, a gift would accompany that blessing to solidify or represent the intent of the blessing, but the gift was not the blessing. The blessing was a declaration of God's favor and goodness upon someone else. That's what a blessing is. You say, okay, Pastor, I understand that. So who do you bless? Well, the one person or the one entity that we're told to bless again and again and again and again in Scripture is God. Say, what I can what hold on. We're supposed to bless God. Yes. One way to do that is in songs of praise and thanksgiving. Say, I don't, I, I don't know if I, I don't, know, I don't know about that. Well, you sing it a lot. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. You want to really have an idea of how to bless God and be grateful and thank God. Take a walk through Psalm 103. We're supposed to bless God. We're supposed to bless others. You know, we are called to bless others and specifically to bless our enemies. Wait a second. I'm supposed to call God's favor upon my enemies? Yes, because the greatest favor, his ultimate favor, is salvation. And why would you not want salvation for your enemies? How many times have enemies gotten saved and become the closest friend and ally? But what we're here to talk about today is blessing children and grandchildren. And we see this all over the sacred text. And, and it's definitely here in our passage. We've seen it again and again as, as Jacob has blessed both Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh. And if you go into chapter 49, you'll see him talk to each one of his sons. So, the, rea the reality is, who you bless, you bless anybody and everybody. Now, I'm not talking about just when they sneeze. That was funny. Because here's the thing. I mean, think about that. What, what do you say when somebody sneezes? You're saying, you may know where it comes from. It's like they thought that, like, you know, your heart and, and you're about ready to die. And they're like, oh, bless, bless you. May God let you live. So be careful who you bless when they sneeze. <laughs> but that's not what the text is talking about. When do you bless? Well, the Septuagint, which is the, uh, the Greek Old Testament, it's Hebrew translated into Greek. The Septuagint translates the Hebrew word bless, which is baraka, into Greek. The word means praise or blessing. And here's the Greek word, eulagia. Sound close to a eulogy? How sad is it that in our culture we often eulogize one who has left us through death, but will very few times speak praise and blessings over those still living? 
Many Jewish families pray weekly over their children and bless them at the beginning of the Shabbat. And I encourage you, use special moments in life to bless your child. We have with, with our children at different times, but especially at their man of God and woman of God ceremonies, blessed our children. And, and some of you have been there in those moments and seen it. So the question really that we struggle with is how do you bless your children? Well, first of all, we have to understand that the idea of blessing starts with God at the beginning of Genesis. And so the whole creation is shown to depend upon God for all blessings and all function. And when we lose sight of that, we lose sight of what a blessing really is. The element of the blessing is really concerned with the responsibility that goes along with the giving of the blessing. When you give a blessing, there is a responsible part from you to help in line with that blessing. For the patriarchs, not only their words, which we see here in Genesis 48, but God himself stood behind the blessing they bestowed upon their children. Parents today need to rely on the Lord to give them the words and the thoughts to express proper blessings upon their children. They too, your children, you, have God's word through the scriptures of God. But you have something that the patriarchs didn't. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior to help you guide through that. The words of the Jewish blessing given weekly are taken from the priestly blessing out of Numbers chapter 6. The introduction to it is altered depending upon whether the child is a boy or a girl. For boys, the introductory line, well, let's look at Genesis 48 verse 20. The introductory line for the Jewish blessing to boys is, May you be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Exactly what, what is said here. By, by you, Israel will pronounce a blessing saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's still done today. Why? Because God's word is eternal. And it stands. For girls, the introductory line is, May you be like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And then, and then for both of them, the rest of the blessing is simple. May God bless you and guard you. May God show you favor and be gracious to you. May God show you kindness and grant you peace. Now, you may find it strange that the blessing for boys singles out Ephraim and Manasseh instead of maybe Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Elijah, Enoch, other biblical leaders who are men. And so, I, I love the answer from the Israeli rabbi Mordechai Elan, who wrote this. Ephraim and Manasseh are the first pair of brothers in the Bible who never see each other as competitors. They do not struggle for power. Their dynamic as a family never seems to be the source of great difficulty in either one of their lives. And so by blessing our children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh, we seek to bestow upon our children the legacy of peace and harmony between brothers. You may want to use something like the Jewish blessing. It's easy to find. I encourage you, use scripture. There are multitudes upon multitudes of blessings found in scripture to be used as you bless your children. You can search through the pages of the Bible. But, but you're going to want to add your own thoughts, your own prayers when giving a blessing. Now, it's going to be very awkward to start this. I get it. It's going to be very, very awkward. But let me assure you, out of everything in your life, you will never, ever regret blessing your children. Amen. You may regret a lot of things in your life or a few things, but blessing your children will never be one of them, no matter how. You may regret how awkward it is, but you'll never regret blessing your children. You may be thinking to yourself, oh, Pastor, can I just pray for them? I want you to listen very closely if that's your thought. Some of you have children who are already grown. 
It doesn't matter the age of the child. Our children need to hear three things from us throughout their lifetime. First, I love you. Second, I am proud of you. And quite frankly, some of us as parents fail in both of those. Ask yourself, when was the last time you told your child, I'm proud of you? Say, Pastor, when was the last time? This week, because I wrote it down. <laughs> because it spoke to me and it had been a while. Third thing our children need to hear is you are good at, and you fill in the blank. Preferably with something they're good at. <laughs> don't make something up. If they're a scholastic, don't say they're good at football. Don't set your children up for failure. So you're if, you're, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you, if they're good at scholastics, tell them they're good at scholastics. But I'll tell you something. All of our children are not smart at scholastics. Oh, <laughs> and you don't have to be. Because scholastics aren't everything. If your child struggles, I have a good friend of mine who struggled all the way through high school to get C's and B minuses. And his parents belittled him because he didn't get A's. Scholastics come easy to some people, they come very difficult to others. But he did his best, and he's an engineer today. His job that he does. I'd say it's Greek to me, but I can read Greek, so that it doesn't, I, I don't under, he has explained it multiple times, and I have no clue what he still does. Because he's brilliant. But some test that some teacher gave, he got a C on. Big deal. Tell them what they're good at. And as you speak a blessing over your child, you can incorporate these things that you want them to hear, which they will never hear in your alone time with God. Mm -hmm. Pastor, can I pray for my child? Absolutely, and you should. But you also need to speak blessings over them. Doesn't have to be weekly, but it needs to be regularly. And this is where we find Jacob. Speaking blessings over his children and grandchildren as death approaches. And so we see what the true ending of life should really be. A blending of faith, of gratitude, love, and hope. A consciousness of the presence and the peace of God. And an assurance of the mercy and blessings of God. That what God has promised he will accomplish. As Jacob closed his eyes, do you see the peace on his face as he realizes it's a good thing to be able to end your life knowing you've completed God's business the way he wanted it done? My prayer is that today you will make or renew a commitment to the cycle that we see. Worship God. Bless your children. Worship God. May you bow with me. In order to be a godly person, to bless your children godly and worship God in a godly way, you must know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's where it starts. There comes a time for every single one of us where we have to realize beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am a sinner and so are you. That you know that there is nothing in your life that you can ever do good enough to balance your life against the holiness of God. And that is why Jesus Christ came and he died, was buried and rose again so that the justice of God could meet the holiness of God and then display the grace and mercy of God. And as you fall before him and you say, I've tried this life, and I've tried it, and I've worked at it, and it doesn't work. Know this. It works God's way. It's not easy. But it's very simple.
trust in the Lord with everything that you have. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and out loud proclaim Jesus is the boss of my life. And that is what the Bible calls being born again. You move from the family of Satan to the family of God for all of eternity and nothing can ever take you out of that. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter the things you've done in your life and how awful you think you are. Salvation is available to any and all who will ask. Maybe you're already saved. And to worship God correctly, for you, it means altering your life to bring it into line with what Scripture is teaching. Whatever it is, wherever it goes, whatever it says, I will follow because God said it. I may not understand it. I may not comprehend it. But God said it. So I must believe it. Each one of us has areas in our life where the Spirit speaks. Maybe salvation. It may be help moving our lives into line of scripture. In a moment, we're going to sing a song, and I'm going to ask you to walk down an aisle if God is speaking to you. You have nothing to do, nothing to say. By coming forward, you're simply saying, I want to worship God, bless my children. Maybe that you have questions and want to talk to someone. Someone will take you into a side room privately. I will not ask you to say anything. I will not embarrass you. Maybe you just want to kneel and pray. Whatever it is, don't leave here today without acknowledging and doing business with God as he's placed it before you. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for your love and mercy to us. Father, I pray for those who may need Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who never come to that point, that you would draw them to yourself. Your word says, if Jesus Christ is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself, and so we thank him on that promise. For those who need to align their life with Scripture as, as the Holy Spirit points things out, Father, give us courage to accept it, believe it, and do it. So that you may be honored and glorified in every thought, every word, and every action. So in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand with us. You respond as God speaks to you.